French, he was rattling on in Spanish. So the same idea of movement and flow. I thought perhaps we should start by taking a more serious approach to the definition and looking at a very famous dictionary to see how it um, defines fluency. Uh, I'm afraid to say in front of my Cambridge colleagues there that I'm, the dictionary I'm using is published by a different university, beginning with O. So the famous... Um, oh, I, sh I should say, by the way, I see you taking notes. No need to, talk, uh, to take notes. The talk is freely available on the web, and I shall give you the web address at the end. You'll get the complete talk, all right? Here's something from the, the Oxford Dictionary. I'm sorry to use that word in, in this context. The Oxford Dictionary says of the word fluent, of speech, style, etc., flowing easily and readily from the tongue or pen. So we have the idea that it's two ideas there. Flows easily, but also this idea of ready. In other words, you have to be ready to do it. And we'll come back to these ideas in a moment. It also says that you can say that a person is fluent, a speaker is fluent, ready in the use of words, able to express oneself readily and easily in speech or writing. I think it's interesting that in those definitions, in both cases, the key seems to be readiness. In other words, you don't have a lot of time to think. You have to be there like that. And that's when your head is through. It's not as simple as that, but that's one of the features, if you like, that the world out there perceives when they perceive that someone is uh, fluent in a language. Why does it matter? I've already mentioned this. It matters for several reasons. Let's take the hard-nosed reasons first. It matters for examinations and assessment. So if we look at the um, common European framework of reference, I'm sorry to have to use the word European here. My view is that we should just quietly drop the word European and just refer to the common framework of reference. But you're probably familiar with this notion of the common European framework, the levels from A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. The common European framework of reference defines a B2 learner, that's in the middle of it, if you like, the B2, as a learner who can interact with a degree of fluency and spontaneity that makes regular interaction with native speakers quite possible without strain for either party. So we're adding something here that wasn't in the Oxford Dictionary definition. We're now saying that, <coughs> excuse me, we're now saying that there are two people involved in this game of fluency, that there must not be any difficulty or strain, not only for the speaker, but for the receiver, the listener. So your duty when you are speaking fluently is to make life easy for the other person. Now that, that raises a huge challenge. It's not enough just to be a great monologue speaker of a language. Fluency is something about making the other person feel at their ease, without strain on either party. That's in the Council of Europe documents, which underpin the Common European Framework of Records. The rule book, that's the definition. That's what the examiners use when they judge people. I mentioned the sociological work earlier, and this is just a reminder of it. Chiswick and Miller, this one particular sociological paper, immigrants who become fluent in the language of their new country achieve greater economic success. There are good reasons for, for us being concerned with fluency and trying to do something about it. Number one, it's a live, living concept in the world out there. Number two, it matters for assessment and examinations. And number three, if you travel abroad to study or to work, you're going to be judged partly on whether you're perceived as fluent or not. If you are not fluent, you will remain forever stacking the shelves in the supermarket. If you are fluent, you may become manager of the supermarket. 
It's that crude, if you like. When we look at the literature, if we look at what experts and applied linguists and linguists have said about fluency, there are, of course, dozens and dozens of papers and books about fluency. If you read through them, if you have the patience to read through them, you can see several themes that come back each time in the definitions of fluency, in the studies that have been done, in the research that's been done. These themes are the following. Oops. First of all, speed of delivery is considered a criterion for fluency. But it's, it's a rather odd criterion in some ways. Right now, I'm in fact speaking incredibly slowly, painfully slowly. If, we were, if I were to speak at this rate, having a social cup of coffee or a drink with you, I think within 10 minutes you would lose the will to live. It would be so painfully slow. On the other hand, if I were to deliver this lecture at normal conversational speed, you would consider it an act of great disrespect. If I was coming in the same country as they talk about fluency, of course people know a lot about fluency, so soldiers love fluency as well. It would be ridiculous. So speed of delivery is bound to the context. It depends precisely on what you're doing with your speaking. What I'm interested in is not the fluency of a speaker like myself in a lecture like this. What I'm interested in is conversational fluency, fluency in interaction, talking to other people and then talking to you. How fast is conversation? Well, on average, native speakers of English produce about 120 words per minute. That's quite fast. Okay? That's not to say that we are going to judge our students and time them in class and say, oh, I'm sorry, you've only managed 97 words, you failed. But if you want to kind of benchmark, that's an approximate benchmark. About 120 words per minute. It's quite fast. That's bad news. The other bad news is what comes in the other criteria. The second criterion is pauses. Fluency is often measured by the degree and length that the speaker is silent. Okay? So automatic systems which are being developed now for automatically measuring fluency, uh, the computers will actually measure how much silence there is and make a judgment in accordance with how quiet voice is for certain periods. Painful, isn't it? Painful. After a while, people start to wriggle and giggle and snigger and say, you know, there's something wrong here. So again, pauses are it's a fascinating aspect of how we speak. There was a very good study done of a number of different languages around the world. I can't remember precisely how many, but it was dozens. Done by a group of researchers called Steiners and uh, a number of other people. And they measured the length of pauses between one speaker and another in you know, many different languages. And they came up with the figure, which is quite scary in some ways, that the average pause between you stopping speaking and me starting speaking was just over half a second. Any pause longer than a second is problematic in conversation. We're talking about conversation now. Try it yourself. Try it. The next time your spouse, your husband, or wife, or boyfriend, or girlfriend says, do you love me? Just pause for a minute. Don't say anything for one second, and you're already on your way to the divorce court, so I can assure you. Okay, so conversation is very demanding. It demands that you do something after half a second. Now, what you do is, of course, um, uh, depending on uh, various factors. 
You have to do something. You have to make a noise. At the very least, you have to grunt or make a noise. You're not allowed silent. If you are silent for more than half a second, people will begin to doubt your fluency. So that's why if someone says to you, what's, um, what's Michael's telephone number? You say, you don't just sit there saying, 0370456092. It's not how we do it. We say, oh, uh, now Michael, yes, now wait a minute, I, yes, I do know it, now hang on. Yes, it's, uh, I think it's 0347. So we're constantly filling this silence. And we have all sorts of strategies for filling that silence. And one of the things that we're able to do in teaching materials is to give a repertoire of strategies for situations like that when you're not ready to answer. But you have to do something, you have to say something. Otherwise, you will be perceived as not fluent. We'll come back to that. But pauses is fascinating. The other thing is coherence, of course. Well, this is pretty obvious. If you are heard as speaking incoherently, people begin to doubt your fluency. So you have to connect things so that they are logical and continuous and, and so on. The final criterion in the literature is automaticity. This relates back to what we were saying earlier about readiness, being ready to speak. To be fluent, a good deal of your language has to be automatic. You can't look for it. It has to be there, ready. And I'll have a look at some examples of automaticity in a moment. But, but that's a, a major criterion, the ability to use language automatically, readily, without hesitation, so to speak. Now, I've been studying this subject, trying to understand it since 1998, when we first began the research for our um, course book, Touchstone and Viewpoint. And we spent the first few years just swimming around in a spoken corpus of North American English. Obviously looking at the grammar and vocabulary, but also trying to understand how good conversations were created and structured, and how fluent speakers achieved this. After all those years, I've come to the conclusion that I can add a couple of criteria for fluency. And I'll present them to you now. I'm going to give you three further criteria for spoken fluency based on the evidence of the Cambridge North American English and British English corpora. Are you all familiar with corpora? Please don't be afraid to say it's not a test, you know, don't sit there thinking, oh my goodness, people both sides of me know exactly what a corpus is, and I'm not sure whether it means a dead body, you know, it's, that's a corpus, okay? So a corpus is simply a large database of texts dumped into a computer, which we can then um, analyze using dedicated software. So if you wanted to know, for example, you want to know as much as possible about business English, you could dump millions and millions, thousands of business texts into the computer and carry out certain analytical operations on those texts. In our case, what we did was we recorded people around North America. We had volunteers wearing little microphones like this and recording their daily conversations. We did it in New York City, in upstate New York, um, Ithaca. Students at Cornell University volunteered for us. We recorded in Chicago, we recorded in Tennessee, and we recorded in California, and a small amount in Canada. Any Canadians here? I'm sorry we don't have as much Canadian English as US English, but there we go. We're working on that one. Um, so our corpus, the corpus I'm going to talk about today, when we were creating the Touchstone program, we had about five million words of spoken English. People recorded themselves in their homes, with their friends in the halls of residence, uh, in cafes and restaurants, even driving around in a car talking to each other. Also recorded in classrooms and advisory sessions uh, with professors. Wide variety of, of recordings. These are then transcribed, dumped into the computer, and we can then analyze them to 
find out how people speak, basically. Okay? Good. The first criterion I want to add is can the learner use chunks accurately and automatically? This relates to the notion of automaticity. And that is that when we speak, most of what we do actually isn't single words. It consists of ready-made chunks of language, ready-made phrases. Most research shows that in a typical uh, spoken text in English, 55% of the content, that's just over half of all the content, consists of ready-made phrases rather than single words. So a typical chunk would be, at the moment, at the moment, at the moment. We don't say, at uh, the uh, moment, that would not be perceived as fluent. So chunks represent the ability to string language together automatically. The second criterion that I want to add, and I'll come back to each one in turn, is can the learner, a speaker, or any speaker, link his or her terms smoothly to the previous speakers using linking words and linking chunks to create this sense of flow? So what I'm interested here is, in, in, in here is, you speak, it's now my turn to speak, how do I create that, join that bridge with what you said so that the listener hears this flow, this movement, this clog, this chagesh, whichever word we care to use for it, this sense of continuity and flow. Third one is, can the, user learn, uh, can the learner use a repertoire of small interactive words? For example, just, actually, I mean, etc. Why this criterion is here relates to a very interesting piece of research done in Scandinavia, in Norway, by um, an English woman who works there called um, Angela um, Hasselberg. Was that difficult to remember her name? And what she did was very interesting. She took populations of school, high school kids, and got assessments from their teachers as to whether their teachers considered them to be high fluency or low fluency pupils. And roughly put them into two groups, the high achievers, the high fluency group, and the low achievers, the low fluency group. Don't take it personally, I'm just doing this as a metaphor of comparison. She then analyzed the oral performance of the high group and the low group, giving them tasks, speaking tasks, oral tasks. And with statistical significance, not just random chance or not just because it looks like that, with statistical significance, the high level group were using these little words, and the low-level group were not using them. I'll, hope, I'll show you later how, how important these words are. The interesting thing about these words is you can speak perfectly correct English without them, but if you can use them, you will be heard not only as correct, you will be heard as more fluent. So it's, we're back to this notion that fluency is a perception of the listener. And this is one of the factors, not consciously, this is one of the factors that unconsciously influences the listener. So oral examiners, for example, do not go into the examination room and say, oh, now I'm going to listen to see if she says just or actually. It's not like that. But what we can demonstrate is that in the speaking of the students who achieve the higher grades, they use these little words. Now, I'll come back to each of these criteria um, in turn. <coughs> so we've got three more. We've got the chunks, we've got the linking, the connecting, and we've got these little words. Let's start with the chunks, shall we? Here's an example of three word chunks from uh, North American English. So the computer says these are the most frequent combinations of three words in North American conversations. I'll read them down. I don't know. A lot of you want to a little bit, I want to, I think it, I mean I, I have to, you have to, you know I, I have a, I think that you know what, what do you want of the don't know if you know what, a couple of, and then I 
than I was. It doesn't make much sense. You can't take that into class on Monday morning and say, okay, these are the most common chunks. Now get into pairs and groups and use them. Of course not. You've got to have something to talk about. We accept that. But what is this rather cold statistical table showing us? What fascinates me is that way out ahead of anything else is, I don't know. Is that because we are such an ignorant bunch, we spend all our time saying what we don't know? And the interesting thing is that I don't know is actually very high frequency, even in our spoken academic corpus. So you might decide that university professors spend all their time telling their students what they don't know. Now, of course, that's not why it's number one. Any guess is why it's so common? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I asked for that one, didn't I? Yeah, yeah I asked for that one. <laughs> um, but just ponder it for a moment and, and think, why should it be that I don't know is the most common joke? <laughs> Any ideas? Like it's a similar way of thinking. It could be that, yeah. I mean, as usual, there, there are, uh, there's a variety of answers. But the most, one of the most common uses of all is to ask a question. There is a big difference between, did you see that documentary about climate change last night? There's a big difference between that and, I don't know if you saw that documentary about climate change. The second question is much more interactive. It's less like a police interrogator, less like a lawyer in a court. It's as simple as that. It's an extremely common chunk used to introduce questions. Now, when we teach our students question forms, we put them through all sorts of torture, you know, the, have you ever been to Bangkok? Um, uh, did you uh, see that program on TV the other night? We can help them a good deal more with these simple little chunks. I don't know if you saw that program. I don't know if you've ever been to Bangkok. It's not rocket science. It's not terribly difficult. And the reason is, of course, that you don't analyze the chunk. A chunk is a chunk is a chunk. You have to learn it as a chunk. You mustn't even think about the grammar of it, the internal grammar of it. That's a disaster. And you have to say it fairly fast. This goes back to the notion of automaticity. I don't know if you saw that program on TV about climate change. I don't know if, I don't know if, I don't know if, I don't know if. It's like, it's like one word almost. I don't know if, I don't know if, I don't know if. Sounds rather strange and not fluent if you say, I don't know if you saw that documentary on TV the other night. That's not fluent. So chunks have to be said quickly. One of the most frequent longer chunks in English, in fact, the most frequent longer chunk is, you know what I mean. It's a five word chunk, you know what I mean, you know what I mean. Yeah. You have to say that pretty quickly. You know what I mean, you know what I mean, you know what I mean, you know what I mean. It's fun actually in class to get students to do this, see how quickly they can say it. The reason you have to say it quickly is that if you say it slowly, you change the meaning. So if someone says, you know, are you going out, coming out tonight? And you say, no, I'm tired, you know what I mean? That's fine, it's fluid. Are you coming out tonight? No, I'm tired, you know what I mean. <laughs> Sounds a bit like an offer you can't refuse, doesn't it? But it, it destroys the meaning. The meaning is in the chunk, say it quickly. Now, this sounds like bad news for the teaching of fluency. It sounds as if we are saying you've got to get them to speak fast. The good news is, the bits of your message which are not chunks, you can take your time and say them slowly, and you'll still be heard as fluent. No, I'm, I'm a little bit tired. That's fluent. But the main message, I am tired, I said it quite slowly. Slow message, fast chunk equals fluent. Fast message, fast chunk equals fluent. Fast message, slow chunk, not fluent. 
So we can be absolutely definite about this. We can, we can say this is a major criterion of fluency. And we can put it in our courses, and we can teach it, and we can put these chunks in and get students to practice them. It's not theory. This is pretty practical, everyday stuff about the language. Moving on, because time is not on our side, I want to look at this question of linking what you say to what the previous person has said. Can the learner link his or her terms smoothly to the previous speakers using linking words and phrases to create a sense of flow? I want to refer here to some very interesting research done by a extremely good Chinese linguist called Hong Yin Tao in the um, University of uh, California, um, Los Angeles, UCLA. And I was very privileged to work with Tao when I was based at Cornell University in the States as a visiting professor. And Tao was one of these lateral thinkers. You know, the easiest thing to do when you have a corpus is click the mouse and generate a frequency list. That's what I did with the chunks. You get the most frequent things down to the rarest things. What Tao said was, well, let, let's not just ask the computer to count words. Let's ask the computer, for instance, to tell us what the first words are that people use when they open their mouths to speak. So he interrogated the corpus and, and asked the computer to come up with what he called turn openers. That is, it's my turn to speak, What's the first thing I say? What do I do? And is there a pattern in this? Is it random or, or is this patterned behavior in some way? Because if it's patterned behavior, obviously we can teach it, we can use it in language teaching. But if it's random, if, if you know, there are 10,000 different words that typically start people's terms, well, we haven't got much hope. Fluency clearly includes the ability to construct a good term and to link it smoothly to other people's terms, creating what I call confluence. I'll come back to that later. And Tao showed that how you start your turn is significant and important. The first words in terms show your reaction to what you've just said. Now, you might say, well, that's obvious, isn't it? Has he come all the way to Thailand just to tell us that? It seems so simply obvious. But if you look at teaching materials, you would think that nobody had ever noticed this part, of course, from my own materials, but that's arrogance. But, but seriously, there is a serious point here that we're not good at noticing the banal, ordinary things that we do when we speak until someone mentions them, and then we say, well, I knew that, I could have told you that. But time and time again, research shows that native users and expert non-native users of English and other languages do not know what it is they say. Okay? Been demonstrated time and time again. Turnovers, this is from Tao's research, primarily attend to what the previous speaker has just said. So when you open your mouth, your first duty is to attend to what you've just heard. It's not to say what you want to say, it's actually to say something about what you've just heard, to do something about it. Okay? And I'll show you some examples in a minute. Turn openers link with the previous turn to create flow. So my conclusion is that this is one of the major factors in that perception of language flowing. That it's not I speak, you speak, I speak, you speak. It's actually more like a river. They're joined, they're linked in crucial ways. They're context sensitive, they're different in business English, different in academic English, and so on. But we won't dwell on that right now. What I'd like to show you is what the computer does when it looks at um, some speech. Here I've got actually British English, but the, the American English is virtually the same. I've got that here as well. And what we've asked the computer to do is to look at five million words of conversation and say, what are the first words that people use when they open their mouths? Computer says they are the following. Yeah, um, I am. Oh, no, well, but you, so yes, it's right. Okay. What does that tell us? Some of it's obvious. 
what it tells us is we spend a heck of a lot of time talking about I and you, but then there's no surprises in that. It also shows us that quite a lot of what we do links with what we just heard, and well, so, right. There's a nice, nice little pearl in, in this oyster as well, which I'm going to point out to you in a moment. You might have already noticed something remarkable about this, but if not, just hold your breath, because we'll get to it in a second. What I'd like to do is just pluck two of them out of this um, graph, well and right. Okay? And this is the American version. You see that they're virtually the same. They're slightly different, but they're more or less the same. If we look at well and right, here's an example of a native speaker conversation from our corpus. These people are talking about planning their, their holiday, their vacation. And they're looking at web pages and brochures and goodness knows what. See that these are like 13, 14 nights. Yeah, it doesn't say what they do, does it? Well, self-drive tours, but oh right, so they don't go, uh, they don't know how many nights. Oh yeah, they do, look. Well, it tells you how, and so it goes on. It looks a bit incoherent in some ways, but I'm sure we'd all be happy if our students uh, achieved this level of speaking. We have our well and our right, and we have other things like O and C. So the turns have this characteristic turn opening pattern. If we ask the computer, okay, so is this just a one-off, you know, well, what's, what's it about this word, well? We can actually ask the computer to look at thousands of examples and to give us a profile of the words well and right. This profile tells me how often well is the first word the person uses, how often is the second word, the third word, the fourth word, etc. Okay? So the computer's looking at where we find the word well. And the computer says well loves to be word number one. It's not too happy as word number two, and it's very unhappy to be anywhere else in your turn. So well is one of these characteristic words that appears at the beginning of what you say. Right is a bit more tolerant <coughs> of other positions. But again, it has a preference for being the first word. When we look at the other word that was in our conversation, O, 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 H, we find that O is only ever happy as the first thing we said. So in our corpus, we find people saying, oh, well, I think it was about five o'clock. We never find anyone saying, well, oh, I think it was five o'clock. So what we can do, and this, this may seem a bit academic, but I assure you it's not, it's, this has been, the grounding of the materials that we write and produce is we can actually produce a sort of hierarchy of how you construct your turn when it's your turn to speak. There is a pecking order in these terms. Some are more powerful than others. We can begin to produce a grammar of speaking. We can begin to produce it like a grammar of taking your turn. It's not random. It's not by chance. There is heavy, heavy pattern in the way we speak, not just the way we write, not just the grammar, not just the pronunciation and so on. There is heavy pattern in how we speak. Have a look at another turn up there. It wasn't in the top 20, but it's a very frequent one. The word basically. Well, what do people mean when they say basically? Me. If someone says, basically, what do you expect to come next? Basically what I mean. Yeah, so some kind of explanation, a long lengthy one or a kind of summary explanation. Yeah, would that the world was like that. What tends to happen is beware the users of basically, because when they say basically, they then go on for about 30 minutes and bore you to tears. But, <laughs> okay, essentially it's about explanation, elaboration. And here's an example. These people are talking about their jobs uh, in the health system. And I think MX, MX, this is the anonymous code we put for people's names in our corpus. We have to protect the privacy of the speakers. 
I think MX was counting on being able to sort of output some stuff over the weekend. Yeah. Basically, our problem is that when we get the thing open with the high rate scans, we find that some of the uh, trannies just won't have that enlargement to that size. Okay, so this guy is trying to give an explanation or something. He starts with the word basically. But if we look at the word basically in our typical graph here, that's what we get. That's what the computer gives us. Don't forget, this is first word you use, second word, third word, fourth word. What the computer says here is basically is happiest when it's the second word in your term. So by now you can explain why that is. Why is it low? Why is it likely to be the second word? Because it's kicked out in the first place by the more powerful words like well and right. In a corpus of 10 million words, we find hundreds of examples of people saying, well, basically, so basically, we never ever find anybody saying basically well. Never. Not one example. So there is an order for creating this continuity, this sense of flow. It's not random. We can establish exactly what people do. When we are writing our materials, we spend a lot of time looking at screens like this. This is a typical corpus screen for anyone who's interested. This is what we call concordance lines. And I spent a good deal of my life looking at these screens. You probably think I'm a very sad individual and I should get out more. Okay. But I find it quite exciting. I'm quite passionate about it. This is a, a random sample for the word basically. These little triangular, uh, sorry, these little brackets here tell me that a new speaker is speaking. And you notice that basically is sometimes first, but very often it's kicked out of first place by words like and, so, uh, well, yeah. So I can, I can get a profile of the word basically. Well, basically, yeah, basically, so basically. And these become useful little chunks. Well, basically, well, basically, well, basically, well, basically. Create an amazing sense of fluency. Now, did anyone spot what was perhaps the most interesting thing about my diagram of the most frequent term of this? I don't expect you to because it took me a while before I thought there's something very odd going on here. The oddness is that the most frequent word in the language, the definite article, the, was actually about number 20. If I were to do the same operation on written texts and ask the computer to tell me what are the most frequent sentence openers in writing, oh, there would be vastly the most common. So how come it's not in the top 10 or 15 or 20 tone openers? What's wrong with the definite article? That's the pattern for the definite article. That's the pattern for the indefinite article. They just don't like to be the first word. Why not? They're the most frequent words in the whole language. Surely we'll find them everywhere, won't we? What's wrong with them that they don't want to be number one? Well, the answer is, it's very simple. They do not link with what you just said. The refers to things, it refers back to things you mentioned, but it doesn't link, it doesn't have that power to create the flow. It just doesn't have it. Now, if you're really observing the course, you say, well, there are, there seem to be a number of occasions when it does come first. But if you look into the corpus, you then find, of course, that when it does come first, it's part of a chunk. The thing is, the problem is, that's when we find the at the beginning of our terms, because it's part of a chunk that links with what you've just heard. So it's a fascinating world to step back and say, how do we speak? Not how do we think we speak, or how do we, how do we get from writing to speaking? No, let's just sit back, 
and do an objective study of what it is we do when we speak fluently. And the computer is saying, these are the things that you do. Okay. I want to consider now something slightly different, but I'm going to use the third criterion, my final criterion about small words here, small interactive words. I mentioned earlier the research that shows that if you can use these little words like just and actually and well and so on, you will be perceived as fluent. So a simple example would be there is a huge difference between saying, can I ask you a question? Imagine a student coming to me as a professor. Can I ask you a question? Fine, perfectly correct, polite English. Compare that with, can I just ask you a question? Well, there's a very little difference. In fact, the word just is probably said so quickly, you don't even notice it. Can I just ask you a question? Could you just wait a minute, please? Could I, could I just ask you to wait until Mr. Smith is ready to see you? These words, they're called small words because we hardly hear them. And again, research shows that native speakers are not aware that they're using them. A very good example, when we first recorded our corpus conversations, we were looking for transcribers. And the secretariat, the assistants in the department office at the university said, well, we'll do that for you, we'll do it in our lunch break. You pay us, we'll do it in our lunch breaks. Ready to go ahead, off you go. And they sat there with headphones on and transcribing, and they gave us the transcripts. And all of these small words were missing. And we said to them, well, look, at this point, person said, can I just ask you a question? And they said, oh, we thought you didn't want that sort of thing in there. We thought you just wanted the main words. So it, it was a fascinating exercise in the perception of the native speaker. It's no coincidence that all the great grammars of English were written by the Scandinavians and Dutch people and so on. You know? <laughs> it's only recently that Brits and Americans have even dared to write a reference grammar of English. How do learners get on with this kind of thing? I'm going to refer now to the um, Cambridge Learner Corpus. We also have a corpus of the learners speaking and writing. And see if we can see any emergence of these, of these small important words from elementary to advanced. So I'm looking at across the levels A2 to C1. We're going to start with A2. Now, don't be put off by the small print here. This is a transcript of a Cambridge examination, an oral examination, the KET, K-E-T, Key English Test, which is A2 level. Okay, so it's, it's beyond uh, elementary, but it's not yet in the intermediate uh, B level. Okay? This is a paired task <coughs> involving two young women from Albania. It's recorded in Albania, in Tirana, the capital. Albania. And they are given a task to do. And the task is ask your partner five questions about her breakfast. Okay. Well, by the looks on your faces, that's something you do every day. Is it ask people five questions about their breakfast? No, I don't think so, surely not. No, it's a classic task, isn't it? The purpose of the task is to get you to ask questions. It's a, it's a crazy task. You wouldn't say to your friend, let me ask you five questions about your breakfast. <laughs> uh, they would certainly think you've gone mad. <laughs> it would be a very strange thing to do. But let's take the task at its face value. It's a task about asking questions. And these are the two girls. And it goes like this. Uh, when do you have breakfast? I have my breakfast at 7 o'clock. Where do you have breakfast? Uh, in my kitchen, in my house. In what room? In the kitchen. And do you have coffee or tea for breakfast? Uh, tea. Uh, what do you eat? I eat toast and a cup of tea. How many days, uh, how many times a day do you have it? Uh, two times. And then there is a pause of four seconds. Okay? Four seconds. And the same girl says, sorry, I don't understand you. Repeat the sentence, please. And the other girl says, how many times a day do you have breakfast? 
And the other girl, and you can hear the exasperation on the tape, she says, one time a day, of course. Now, what's of interest here is, firstly, if we don't find any of these small words, except for something like, of course. What is interesting is that there's a four-second pause here. Now, remember what we said earlier. Anything longer than half a second is a problem. Four seconds. Major problem. What interests me here is that the two girls are not the only people in the room. There is a third person, the examiner. And what is the examiner doing at this point? Well, he or she is sitting there, like the Egyptian Sphinx. <laughs> the examiner is not allowed to speak. The examiner is sitting there, observing this agonizing silence. But that's fine. That's how exams function. Let's imagine this was not an exam. Let's imagine this was a conversation in, out there in the real world with three people around a coffee table. And there's a pause of four seconds. Whose responsibility is it to fill the silence? This is my question to you. Whose responsibility is it to fill a silence of four seconds? The third person. The last person who spoke. The next person. So we have got three answers here. Uh, you're all you're all right because the the, the 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 answer is simply it's everyone's responsibility. In a collective conversation, whether it's two people, three people, or four people, nobody nobody has the right to sit back and say. Oh, they're suffering. <laughs> oh, she's sweating. I'm going to let them sweat. Of course not. It is our responsibility as participants in a conversation. All of us have the responsibility to keep it going. All of us have the responsibility to fill those silences. And in the real world, maybe the third person would have said, I don't think she quite understood you there. Or maybe the, the first the girl who made the crazy question might say, um, oh, sorry, was that, a, was that a crazy question? Let me ask it again. So the point about flow, the point about fluency takes us right back to the beginning, to the Oxford Dictionary. Okay, sorry to use that word. The Oxford English Dictionary, and that is that fluency is something that must not create, it, it must be flowing and ready and in the common European framework of reference must not create strain for either party. Everybody has the same responsibility. So this notion of filling the silence is all important. Now, we don't expect too much of this lower level conversation. The turn openers are not there. It's a bit like police interrogation. It's a bit like lawyers in a courtroom, isn't it? We could help them. We could, we could teach them some little turn openers that would create a better sense of flow here. And that's what we try to do in our materials. We try to teach the small words. We try to show how important words are like just and actually and well and so on. But at what point do learners actually start to master to control this kind of language? Well, let's jump up to B2. B2 level now, we're in the intermediate level. And we have a young Chinese female here doing her oral examination. And she's uh, talking to the examiner. The examiner is E. There are two examiners in this room, E1 and E2. And that's the student. And the examiner says, OK, are you a big fashion person yourself? And she says, um, actually, yes. But however, you know, I'm a student now, so I don't have a lot of money. In the near future, when I have a job, I can have a job, I can afford myself a lot of luxury things. Uh-huh. And who's your favorite? Is Chanel your favorite designer? Yeah. And who else would you like? Um, actually, I, I like Coco Chanel very much. Okay, so she's saying, I don't really want to talk about anybody else, I just like Coco Chanel. So she's used actually twice here. So how's she doing? Is she overusing it, underusing it? 
How do we judge this performance? So what we can do is we can benchmark performances. We can say, okay, on average, what do we expect of a B2 learner? What do we expect of a C1 learner? What do we expect of a native speaker? We're not necessarily concerned with comparing her with native speakers, though I'll show you where we can do that. What we're interested in is benchmarking typical behavior of students at particular levels. We call these profiles. And this data and all of my talk this afternoon is part of a major project called the English Profile Project. And the English Profile Project sets out to describe exactly what we mean by an A2 student or a B1 student, or a B2 student. Up to now, the definitions of these students have been quite vague. You know, the B2 student must be able to speak spontaneously and fluently without straying the right party. It doesn't help teachers very much. So what we're trying to do with the English Profile Project is to say, if your students here in Thailand benchmarked against students from over 100 countries around the world, Benchmarked against them, if your students are aiming to be B2 students or C1 students, they should be able to do the following when they speak. And we can specify precisely, they should be able to use words like actually and just in, the, in their oral performance. If you're interested, just go to the web and look at the English profile. I'll, I'll, I'll mention it right at the end again, but that's the context of all this stuff I've been talking about. And we can benchmark it. Um, in terms of the common European framework. The first time we see it at the beginning of speakers' terms, doing this, this linking, this flow business, typically is B2. Some students do it at B1 or even A2, but the bulk of students around the world control this kind of language at B2. So if you're sitting there saying, well, my students are B2 and they can do this, jolly good. That's very good. If you're sitting there saying, well, my students haven't got a hope of using words like that, then all we are saying is, we're not saying you're bad teachers or, you're bad or they're bad students. We're just saying, if you are interested in benchmarking Thai students internationally, then we have these benchmarks that you can refer to. It's called the English Profile. So it emerges at B2. By C1, 10% of all uses of actually are the first or second word in the student's term. Okay? So they, by C1, they're saying, actually, I prefer conventional, or they're saying, well, actually, or, but actually. Okay, so they've mastered this term initial process by C1 to the extent of 10% of uses of actually. If you're interested in how this compares with native speakers, if you look at a native speaker corpus, native speakers achieve 11% of all uses of actually are um, term initial. So the C1 learner is, is achieving something close to native speaker usage there. But how do they get there? There are two ways of getting there. One is the slow way, and that is you don't learn it, you just stick around and watch 10,000 movies and listen to 1,000 pop records and you might pick it up. The fast way is to actually, actually, is to actually introduce it into the materials and make it the teaching point so that we can speed up this process of achieving fluency. I'm going to um, just show you, you know, the way that we put this into our material. We, we, put in actually as a strategy plus, and we do it because we know for a fact that if native speakers don't notice how they use these words, then you can't expect your students to notice it. Your students will not come in next Monday morning and say, teach me all about actually. Well, you might get a clever student who does that, but in the main, they're no more aware of the importance of these words than we are as native speakers or expert non-native users. People do not know that they're using these things, but the research shows convincingly that they are affected, their perception of fluency is affected by their occurrence.
occurrence or not. So you have to start by simply putting it on the page and saying, notice how we use the word actually. You can use actually to get new or surprising information. You can use actually to correct things that people say. Actually is one of the top 200 words. If I went to a language school to learn Thai or Japanese or Russian, and the director of the school said, welcome to our school. In this course, you will learn everything about the target language, except the most important and most frequent words. I think I would want my money back. It would be a very odd thing to say, I'm going to teach you everything about the language, but not these most frequent common words, not the words that create fluency, not the words that create interaction and good relations with your fellow speakers. I'm not going to bother with that. I think I want my money back. I'm going to jump on this because you're probably familiar with the way you can go from control for your practice. So even with this kind of language, you can do closed tasks, gap fills, matching exercises, and then develop some kind of pair work, which we put into our materials. But I'm going to conclude by going right back to the first point about assessment. The Cambridge Examinations produces little booklets which tell you how to succeed in their exams. Quite useful little books. This particular booklet tells you how to succeed in the oral exam for the first certificate in English. Okay? The book is called Top Tips, and it's produced by the examination board. And here is a model for how you should behave in the uh, oral exam if you're going to score top grades. And what we notice is the turn of books. They're all there. These words like well, absolutely, and chunks like I agree, and the chunks like and another thing, and another thing, and another thing, not and uh, another thing. No. So the examination board, the assessment board at Cambridge, whether consciously or unconsciously, we can't say, are saying this is how you behave if you are a model speaker of English at this level. If you want this full paper, this full presentation, this talk and academic references, just go to englishprofile.org and put in fluency or put in my name, Michael McCarthy, and you will be able to download in PDF form the complete talk which I've just given. So thank you very much for listening.